So my name is Hansi, and um, Chris and I, Cherubim Fenderson, we worked together a lot since a long time on, on oscilloscopes. And so today I'm going to talk about the software mostly that we've been developing. It's called Aussie Studio. And Chris is also going to talk a lot about similar stuff. So I, I'm first going to talk a little bit about myself, the other things that I do, what's my background, and then give a brief tour of OSC Studio and then hopefully go into one crazy detail which I think is important and then do the 103 examples really fast as promised in the talk title. I, I started programming very early as a child. So for me it was always, I, I started programming commercially when I was 15, so for, for me it's Im important, I really like commercial work and it's important to sort of keep me on my toes because you have to work with tighter schedules and it forces you to do things you don't like and it typically benefits you. So I'm, I'm going to go through like uh, two of the last things that I did. Um, this was, I, I did, the, it's for a robot Hoover company and they have a fair. So I do the programming, like I don't make the content, but I do the programming of the LED floor and the screen, and then there's an app that controls the robot. So it's a big, big mambo jumbo of technology just to attract visitors and, you know, to advertise the product. So another project, which I can't show the latest version uh, because it's not released yet, but this is already out on the internet and everyone can download it. So this is for a big company, everyone knows. And it's very specialized video editor, and it just adds like the rings at the end of every advertis advertisement. <laughs> it does nothing else, and it adds the soundtrack like the chong chong heartbeat. Um, and this I do with Kasuga Studio, a guy in Berlin. And it's like this is quite meticulous about detail, about precision. So this is work I would never do in my free time because it's just painful. But then it's it's really rewarding when you have it and it works and 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 people use it, and y you see it. So uh, then I do a lot of stuff that's really not commercial, and, and one thing I like doing is, is workshops. I'm, I'm going to show some workshops. This was two years ago for kids between 12 and 15 to get into Arduinos, and so I thought, ah, maybe I can do something with just two servos and give them commands to left and right, just control the servos and bang at stuff. So it was called the Tiny Drama, the workshop. And they, they built sort of things like this. This was my test setup. And then you do this. And, and they put the commands just left, right, both, left, left, right. And it was a two-hour workshop. And surprisingly, they all managed. I, w I was quite amazed how quick they picked up the coding. Because I didn't explain it to them at all. I just told them, like, look at it. just try to change some commands and it worked. So let's see some other workshops. Uh, this is a very old workshop. It was called the Cocktail Robotics Workshop where we built machines. This was a bit more advanced, but built machines that make drinks somehow. This one does like a, a, random, a random distribution of drinks. You never know what you get. Someone built this. Uh, someone else built this. It like squeezes out the, the vodka and you have to catch it. You don't know where it comes. Then <laughs> um, this was a workshop series I did for a while. It was called the Suicidal Robots Workshop. It was about self-destructive machines. So, so Oliver here in the picture, he built a stabbing bot, which tried to cut its own cable um, so that it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, and then, so my next workshop is going to be in November, and it's going to be called, if possible, with electricity where we put electricity in things that really don't need it. <laughs> um, so then I do some, some nonsense projects. This is a company I have which uh, makes products for people who think they will die soon, but they still want to be socially connected. So this particular device, it's an implant for like your upper leg and it draws the power from your heartbeat, and once it gets no power, with like the last juice, it sends out, uh, I think, either a text or a Facebook message, like, it, and you pre-upload your final goodbyes, and it puts them to everyone. Uh, this is another 
fake company which makes flutes for people who snore. And um, and then, I mean, I, I tried to branch out a lot with the programming, so that's a data mining experiment where I take data off of Wikipedia, I search for TV shows and put them in a list. So the idea is to see, is it, is it possible to take this unstructured Wikidata and put it in a structured format? It works surprisingly well. It still gets like 10 to 20,000 visitors a day. And I, I have nothing to do. Like I, I think the last time I had to fix something was like two years ago. So this is like, I don't know, it's just going by itself. What else? So I got into sound roughly around 2010. And this is the first application I did. It's called Soundy Singy. So the idea, do I have a video? Yes. So the idea here is it was an iPad application, which was perfect because it came out just at the time. I made it for a PC, but then this, this beautiful touch device came out. So the idea is you draw the lines, and then the frequencies correspond to to the position on the screen, so you draw down, it goes whew, and it just records your speed, and then yeah, you just draw your soundscape and have fun with it. So uh, it's the first project I put a lot of time into. Before I was always doing like five-day projects or two-week projects, and this I put a year into, and uh, it, it really paid off. And then shortly after, I, I, I got to know Chris, and he dragged me into the whole oscilloscope mess. And then I, I already knew it's it's going to be rewarding to put a lot of time into something, and, and like it's it's nice to take a deeper dive. Um, if you want to see more random projects, I don't really have a website. I just put everything on YouTube. I do short screen recordings, and there's no I don't know there's no structure. It's just sorted by time. I'm gonna get into. Let's get started. Who, I'm, I'm curious, who has used it already? Is there any, anyone here who knows it? One, two, three, four, five. OK, under half. That's good. So what I'm going to show is the latest version. It's not going to matter so much in the beginning, um, but it's going to matter in a bit. And I'm, I'm hoping to upload this today. It's, it's still not done, but I think it's time to release it into the wild. The last release is two years ago. The way the application is developed is Chris and I meet every other month or something, and then we just talk about things a lot. And then I kind of try to systematize what's wh what I think is important to to make it easier and and to work with more complicated shapes, but at the same time to be able to go all the way down. And this is now you can go a lot more down. So this is one I want to show. First, I'm going to show a standard workflow, which would be that you, you work on just one channel. Let's turn all of this off. Um, and then you, you pick a shape. You can either go in with Blender, so you can put any 3D model you like, or you just pick one of the predefined shapes. So it's possibly going to be loud. Um, I'm going for the cube here. And Okay, so that's already nice. You have the cube. So this, this top structure is sort of what are your shapes. I can right click again and then with shift add another on top. So add Rosetta. Now I have both of them here and I can fade them in and out. So this, this is how you get started. Um, and now in the new version, it also supports a lot more formats. So you, you can draw, you can put SVG files and uh, from 3D printing, if someone knows it, G-code files. And I support the very ancient uh, Quake computer game animation format. Um, so you, you can track those in. And then, so after this, after the shapes, you can apply effects. And it's just a linear chain of effects. So rotate is, of course, always important to prove that it's 3D. 
So you let it rotate, and then you, you make the shapes go in and out. And I think this already makes quite beautiful sounds. And, and then you can animate everything. You, you can go crazy with the animations. Um, and there's a lot more other ways to like put the numbers. Like you can MIDI map it, and there's cues. But but I don't wanna. Th that's not what I'm aiming for. What I wanna aim for a little bit is like how how does this work, and like what what is what is the mathematical structure behind this? Why why is it so easy to put all the sources in and then work on them no matter what it is? Um, okay, so before I go on, because now I, I really want to dive into one specific thing and not, not talk too much about this anymore. Are there any questions so far? Perfect. Okay. So what I want to talk about today is, is face control. And before I can explain this, I want to explain a little bit what the face is. And fortunately, we have this fancy thing. Um, and, and I want to draw just a quick graph of how sound works, and then I'm going to show it to you. So this is what's left and what's right. This is left. OK, so I have to draw in reverse. <laughs> OK, so. So this is the time axis. I mean, we all know sound is, is linear, like it always moves with time. And in here, we draw the amplitude of the signal. I'm, I'm very confused if you can read this, because it's also upside down. So oh, this is going to be very, maybe I just switch sides for a second. OK. So. No, no, don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's, I have it under control. Okay, so, so we, <laughs> we have amplitude and time, and the normal sound signal w would be some squiggle like this. It always goes forward and it goes up and down, and like this is what you put into the speakers, and then you can hear it. And in OSCE Studio, the the way it works is you start with what is called a phaser, which is a very simple sawtooth wave. So it just looks like this. And, and interestingly, I call this up here, I call this T, even though we put the time here. Because what I want is I want a small number that goes always from 0 to 1. Is this still? Yes, it's still on camera. And, and what I want to do is I want to see a shape as a function. So now I need to explain what a function is. It's, so function is one of the most fundamental mathematical concepts. And the, the idea behind this, it's just sort of an abstract idea to describe a process. And the process would be, say, Bernhard is a function. And, and I ask him something, so I give you a number zero, and then you give me back a point in 2D. So I ask you like zero and, and you give me you you give me no you give me the coordinates of one zero. One zero is what you give me. S so we set T is zero and then we get the point one zero in the coordinate system. And now I ask you time is I don't know one eighth or something like zero point one two five and you say this is around something with square root of 2, maybe 1 divided by in x and y. You just know the point, and you tell me, oh, it's here. And then the next one at the quarter, it's here. And we, we construct all these points. And I mean, a function doesn't have to be from one number to two numbers, or from one number to two numbers, but from anything to anything. And what this anything and anything is, that's called the domain. And in sound, or especially for oscilloscope music, what's interesting is to go from the domain 0, 1. So we, we start with some number that is inclusive 0, but then exclusive 1. 
and we turn it into a point. And a point, a mathematician would write just R3, which means X, Y, and Z, just three random points. And the important thing is that the process is deterministic. You need to always get the same answer. Um, so if I ask you 10 times, what's the point that corresponds to zero, you have to give me the same response 10 times. Um, because once you have this, you, you can combine these two. So what you do is you, you have this phaser, and then for every point on the phaser, you ask your function, hey, what's, what's the point again? And then you put this point on the oscilloscope, and if the phaser is here, you ask it, hey, what's, what's zero point, I don't know, seven five? And the function tells me, ah, that's, that's here. Um, and so once you can see anything in the world as, as this mapping from zero, one to R3, so a function is also called a mapping, it's like synonymous. Um, once you found this, you're good to go. And this is how I try to see everything in OSCE Studio, and that's, that's how you combine everything. And I'm gonna demonstrate this, um, and I'm gonna show you yet another way to write this. But remember, when you see something with an arrow and funny symbols on the left and right, that's usually a function. At least when a mathematician writes it, when a programmer writes it, it looks a bit different. I'm gonna show you now. Um, it's, it's probably getting a bit dense. I'm not sure because once you understood it, it's, it's hard to understand. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm currently using floating point precision, which is quite all right already. I'm thinking about switching to double precision because I've found out recently that doubles are actually faster than floats. At the moment, it's floats, which is crazy precise. It, it's, it's as close to infinity as we can get, like resolution-wise, uh, on a computer. Um, okay, so so let's see how how this mapping how how this would look when a programmer writes it, and there's some code here, and we just look at the first line. So to to remember, I put here the way we wrote it before. We wrote I wrote something goes from zero to one, and then it maps into R. I have to write it like this here R three, and then. On a computer, you, you write it all funny. First, you need to give it a name, which we could also do here, Chen, which is just something so we can refer to it. And then, so T, T would correspond to this, like something. And then it returns R3, which here is called the VEX3. Like, so it's three, three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. So you see all the orders are messed up in the computer version. You don't see that the t goes from zero to one, but it's just something you have to live with. Like everyone has slightly different ways of saying the same things, and there's many other ways even to do this. So for now, let's just look at the phaser to, to get a little bit more, maybe a bit of understanding. Like I'm, I'm assuming there's some people who haven't even seen code, so this will be funny. Um, but but really, this line is where the computer asks us, here is a number t. And your job, like our job now, is to make a point in 3D space. So here we make the point. We call it v, like vector. Um, and then we assign to it just the t. And we can already hear something, and we see a line. And what's happening now is this is happening in very rapid succession. You see the phaser is set to 50 hertz. So 50 times a second we are queried. Well, no, actually a lot more, but 50 times a second it goes from zero to one. And then we just move the x-axis. Um, I'm gonna show you two things. First, we record this. Uh, something, something, dot wave. All right. And let's turn off the sound and go into Audacity, which maybe people are familiar with. It's just a way, way fewer. Let's look at this. Uh, so you see the y-axis is completely 
blank. It's zero all the time. And then on the x-axis, you, you can see the thing that I drew you before, and it's just the phaser going. Um, and if we zoom in, hopefully we can even determine the frequency. So you see between here and here, it's around 20 milliseconds, which corresponds to 50 hertz. Um, all right. So what can you do with this? I mean, you can do insane amounts of things already with this. Um, so first, we switch it on. And I show you one more thing, which is the frequency. Let's make it very slow so we can follow the dot. So I go to 1 hertz slowly. We are 20 hertz now. And now you can, you can slowly see what's happening. It's not really a line. It's the dot moving. And there it goes. And now let's put something more interesting. Um, the starting point for everything, if you want to get into this yourself, is this Wikipedia page called parametric equation. So that's what mathematicians would call this type of thing. And, and it, of course, just to confuse everyone, there's like 100 different ways of writing them. Here's one. I'll make it bigger. So you see here it says x is the cosine of t and y is the sine of t. Let's just try it out here. So x is the cosine of t. And it's not going to work. And I'll explain in a second why. And y is the sine of t. All right. And I'm going to make it faster again now because we're more interested about in the shape in general and not just uh, the slow dot. So it's not really the full circle. And the reason is this t is supposed to be from 0 to 2 pi and not from 0 to 1. Like, it's another domain, really. So we want from 0 to 1, but this needs to be from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, so let's just multiply by 2 pi. And let's also multiply this by 2 pi. And there we have the full circle. Um, so what can you do now? Now you can add some, some stuff. Because this, I think, is already quite nice. That you can, If you don't have the full domain, you just see a small part of the shape. And this is what really drives a lot of our ideas, as simple as it seems, just like not using the full face. So I'm going to put a slider to help us figure it out, and I call it cut. And then I do t times 2 pi to get the full circle. But then I multiply with cut. And now, so I got this slider cut. And when I open it up, I can show parts of the circle. And this idea works now with everything. So let's get rid of the circle. And what's interesting to me is we should have nothing. Now we have nothing. Good. <laughs> OK. So let's put a complicated shape. Let's put the Rosetta orbiter. And here we can ask input. So input, what, what this does, it, this, this goes up. So you have this plugin now. And, and it asks input of t, so it just asks up. And up, we just have the Rosetta. So here we have t. And again, let's look at it very slow. On the 5. And you, you can see how it's tracing out the dots. I, I make it fast again, because I think this is understood now. And now if we don't uh, go from 0 to 1, but just from 0 to 0 0.5, then I get like a little part of the shape. And uh, let's call this offset now. Let's add this offset here and see what happens. So, so if you think about the numbers that come in and go out now. So this is going to be 0 to 1 always. Let's just start with 0. And 0 half is 0 plus offset is also 0. So we ask input of 0. And then the maximum is going to be 1 here. So this is something between 0 and a half now, which is why we get half the shape. 
If I put the offset to something a bit over, like 0.2, then this here is going to be in the range from 0 0.2 to 0 0.7, like because we're going to be 0 0.2 and then plus 0 to a half, something like this. So by moving this around, I can I can select which part of the shape I'm seeing, and I can animate it, and I can do this effect, which is already very nice. Uh, and I can make another slider, which I typically would call links, and I would multiply it just onto T. And so now I have two sliders, and one selects me how much of the shape do I want to show, and the other selects me. I'm going to make it a bit louder so you can hear. Yes, I think acoustically this this already is is, is quite quite cool for like the starting of everything. <laughs> Okay, am I still making sense to you? Please nod a little bit. Yeah, okay, questions? How, how, how far does frequency go? It goes like really high up. Um, so in Osti Studio, no slider is limited. You can put any number. Uh, okay, of course... Yeah, I'm more thinking like, because like, Maybe you have uh, other uh, type of usage, but typically I don't think I go over 100. I in sometimes do. Set up because it gets too, too. So what I find funny in Osti Studio is that you can't really use the slider between 0 and 50 because it's so, you have the type values, which is not a big deal, but I was just curious, like why did they use that? Now, you know what? Actually, I'm going to write it down. I think to like go to 200 is plenty. But um, I, I have a file somewhere. Uh, does something look like to do? I don't see my notes file. Okay, but if you remind me, I, I think it can be changed to not code to, no, to a thousand. Just, uh, I was just curious, actually. Is there I some. No, uh, it's historic. Uh, uh, it's historic. Okay. Also, I like to put really high numbers a lot of times. Like, it makes no sense, but just to put a million. Is often quite interesting. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, and I do it for a lot of things, like to just put minus on the number to sh that should be plus. But this like actually shows how uh, much good work you put into the visualizer because it kind of behaves. Of course, it's not the same as oscilloscope, but it follows the 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 pattern, like what happens with the, with yeah. the thing when it goes fast. So so this is now what Chris and I tested a bit yesterday. It's accurate to roughly a quarter of the of the sampling frequency. So at the at the Nyquist frequency is already quite wrong, mm -hmm. um, but it's still it's it's getting closer and closer to the real deal. Slowly, is okay. improving. Great job. Okay, so um, so one more thing I want to show about the f I want to show a lot more things about phase control, but not too many to not drive anyone insane. Um, so let's go back to something simpler and let's get rid of, should we get rid of the sliders? Yes. Yes. Are these uh, knob inputs like um, um, offset and what else did you have? Are they pre, um, already pre-existing or do you, do you have to define them to something that you coded in the live coding right. window. Right, I didn't really go into this. So here you, let's turn this off again and go back to the original. Somehow, why is this not off? Ah, we have a million here. Okay, we're good. Um, so there's all these default things and you can add more. So the one I just showed you how to program it is actually in the application is called trace. So you see here it has links and it has here it's called from and not offset. So let's put a lower links and then from. So so this should look familiar to you, like the effect itself. Um, and so what I'm using all the time now is this new thing called live coding where you can make your own. So you would say slider and then cool slider. And then all of a sudden you have it here. Uh, and you can do stuff like you can set the range that works from 1 to 10. It sort of works. Yeah, it works. 
Um, yeah, so and th this is the big new feature to really let everyone make their own of these and to really experiment in a very immediate, responsive environment with coding at the at the sound level, like at the sample level. Okay, I I I realized I knew how to make the slider, but how did you map it to a function so that it affects the image? Like you had the slider, cool slider. You, yeah, you just you just anything. put it somewhere in your equation. Like I'm, I'm going to do it again so you can see. So, uh, so underneath the slider uh, command. Yeah, so I put the slider links, and now so far it does nothing. Because okay. it's not part of my gen function. So I, if I don't use it, then it's not going to affect. Here's a nice bug. but So it's not affecting anything. But if I use it, so now I'm multiplying. So, so you see lengths and oh, lengths. Okay. So these need to match. And now I can actually use it. Yes, so that's the that's the connection between those two, and the idea is often you really want to explore changes, and it's not so. I mean, you could also do it like you could you could just play with the numbers here. You could write 0.5 and see what happens, and 0.4, but you go you go a bit crazy after a while. So you just put a slider, play with the slider, and then you put more sliders and play more. Uh, that's the general process. I've got a question. Is this uh, is this just standard C code, or do you have you um, documented this somewhere? All the the, the commands that you have. Uh, so it's it's C plus plus, and it's a special variant of C plus plus. I mean, it's not the variant, but a, a type of usage which is called freestanding. So I don't tie into the operating system, which means you can't allocate memory. You you can't do a lot of other things. Um, but it's it's perfect for this type of thing. Like you can still have arrays, you can have classes, you you have operator overloading to properly use vectors. You have everything you need, basically, for DSPs. But for example, slider, is that your inclusion into this library? Yeah. Okay. You can where are those documented? Um, okay, so there's two things um, that come with the package now. So I'm going to go into some version. Let's see. Okay, so the last, this is the version that I sent to Ivan. Um, and so you see it comes with a few documents. It comes with the hello, which you know, it's like basics of the application. But then now it also comes with this uh, HTML file, which has like all the commands and how to use them. And this I'm, st I'm still working on, uh, because this is a lot of work. And then there's also this document, like a PDF, which I'm probably going to incorporate into the HTML documentation. But this is like a basic uh, sort of a quick guide, like how to get started, how to get set up, what's the typical commands you would use. And then there's also here, down here, there's examples where I'm already, I already have most of the stuff that's by default in OSC Studio. You can put it here and then look at the code, how it's done internally. So I'm trying to open this all up, like how, how does it work? How, how do you code it? And, you know, it's there. Um, so, for instance, here is the butterfly, like very important. All right, I got a little bit dragged away. So, I'm what I want to do is I want to show one more thing how to code it, and then show where it would be going if we would go crazy today, and then we do the examples. So, okay, let's look at this again. So. Here we have t, and if I multiply t with t with t, something interesting happens because you can see now some some parts are brighter now and some others are darker. It's, it's a bit subtle, but this effect um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move it around a bit. I'm not gonna explain the equation too much. Um, because I feel I've been going on for too long already. OK. So it's animated, so you see it move around. OK, so now you can see I'm, I'm sort of highlighting parts of the objects. And I, I could do this a lot more extreme to sometimes hide stuff and um, 
and some and show only certain things that are like and this is sort of uh, what Chris's talk is gonna be a lot about like how how do you use this and and Osti Studio contains so this is this is the last thing I'm gonna show and this is gonna be very complicated and I don't expect anyone don't feel bad if you don't understand it um, so last year I made a very special oscilloscope data structure um, called the remapping tree and so we just put T again here and the idea is that there's a, a problem with parametric curves is where it's really hard to do geometric operations so what's the hardest thing is to quickly do something like cut off a part or show a like cut off a part that's either behind some place or in front or to the side of something and this is where the remapping tree helps and so it's a data structure that lets you set weights on the different parts of the shape so I'm gonna make a tree here and then once per sample we need to figure out where we were I'm just gonna do this very quickly um, Okay, so essentially what I have so far is I still have the same chain, that's why nothing is changing with the sound. And then, but every sample I do something else, I keep a, like I go through the shape a lot slower. Like I, I look at it a little bit here and there and here and there. And now with this, um, we also do this. Now with this, I'm gonna ask the shape, like wh where are you? What's your what's your point? Um, and this T has nothing to do with this T. Just just saying. So what I can do now is I can calculate a weight based on the position because I have the position, and let's just try to calculate the weight. So I could say something like the weight is the absolute value of x. Um, and then we do, so what we have now, let's, I'm going to paint the picture because this makes no sense so far. What I'm going to try to achieve is the following. Uh, we have the little thing here. And what I want to do is to only show this region inside and get rid of all of this. So basically we could say, so here, we have x, and here, let's say x is 0 0.5, and here x is minus 0 0.5. So we could say we have a weight, we assign a weight of 1 whenever we're inside, and a weight of 0 whenever we're outside. Let's try this. Um, so I could do something like this. If vx less than minus 0.5, or vx so we get rid of this larger than 0.5 then we set the weight with index update index and we set it to 0 because we're outside and else we set the weight to 1 I really hope this works uh, we need to do this at the end reasons um, okay so the, the last thing we need to do is we need to ask the tree to remap this time for us so now it's cutting this um, and it's quite insane like now you're astonished <laughs> um, yeah really uh, I, the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, how, how this looks like. What's th what's the face like now? So what's what's inside this this tree? What is it doing to the shape? So we're not going to show the shape. We don't care about it just for a second, and we just look at the graph. So I just plot t on one axis, and I plot what the, the remapping tree does on the other axis. So normally, you remember this picture with the, let's go back for a second to the original picture. So you can see the phase I was going 0, 1, 0, 1, and it's, it's a very nice linear motion. And what the tree helps me do is it helps me cut out little 
chunks of the phaser that I don't want. And to do this fast, you need some little tricks. And it's where, it, where the special data structure comes in. And I have zero tutorials for this now. And actually, we still haven't used it so much. But it's, I don't know, for me, it's quite exciting. So, OK, I think everyone should have lost me now. I'm completely not lost, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you can try to lose me better. Um, why wouldn't you just simply clip the values mathematically? Because then the, the edges become very bright. Ah, because, yeah, I understand. Because, because then, then you then put the all the density. Yeah. That's yeah. one thing. And the other thing is this lets you do a lot of other things, too. Um, I, I'm not sure if you were um, here last night when I was asking about the... the um, uh, hidden hidden lines problem. We were looking at um, at Sketchpad from 1963 and uh, noting that uh, already in 1963 they'd figured out how to hide the the hidden lines inside of a structure so yeah. that you only see the faces. And uh, I mean, they they of course had a simpler problem because they uh, can compute the whole solution and they don't need to do it in real time. Like they don't need to do it in audio time. Um, and they need to do it usually once for a static image. Like this process needs to run very precise, pretty much 100,000 times a second. So you need a different strategy. You, you can't do it the way they did it. And then Chris is going to talk also why other problems. There's more problems. Um, OK, that's it. I showed 103 examples. And then I think it's enough. Maybe if there's questions, we do questions. So what those files are is I, my whole process involves a lot of testing. I, I test all the time, and I work in very tiny tests just to make sure I understand the features I'm adding to the software. So these are uh, it's a, a big chunk of the tests that I did over the two years it took to develop this live coding feature. So pretty much every test is live coding, and I've to save you some time, it's one second per example. Go.
For me, one of the hardest things was to give up the idea that the application should be easy to use. <laughs> <laughs> now it's sort of unlimited, but I don't know. I, I'm hoping some people are going to make something out of it. All right. That, thank you, Hansi. That was uh, beautiful. Was yeah. really <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, one of the first, uh, at the start of this test, um, the sound was very vocal. Yeah, it happens sometimes. But that just like... The, well, I don't remember which test it was. I, I tried a few that were like FM modulating sound input onto the shape. But sometimes it just happens. Uh, um, just because of like the shape that you want to... Yeah, draw. the shape and the weird combination of the effects. Do you know why it happens sometimes? So we, we, I think maybe we, we melt into the next talk also. Uh, I'm just going to... Oh, yes. Sorry. So um, uh, the vowels of, of speech, they have a certain frequency range, and it depends on the vowels that you have. Uh, quite often it, it has two frequency peaks, like somewhere around, I don't know, between 1,000 and 2,000 hertz. And uh, if some shapes happen to have the same overtone spectrum or roughly the same, then it starts to sound a bit like like vocals. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience? It's not so much. It was related to just uh, in the beginning you were showing the the thing that has the mine from Wikipedia and. Uh, can you just explain shortly how that was set up, like, basically? Because I do some stuff that mines from, like, the categories for, for some things. So oh, the Airdates yeah. TV site. Yeah, so it's how does this structure How initially? does it work? It's one of the most disgusting pieces of code I've written. I mean, Aussie Studio has some ugly yeah. sites, actually, a lot. But this is worse, because this is basically it's five pages of regular expressions. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, well... That, that, that's how you do it, and then a lot of uh, man-made heuristics. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no smartness, no, no learning. No. Okay, 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 but but still, mine does mine doesn't either. either. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not going that far. Come on over here. <laughs> Uh, just for some public pressure, I was curious, when is the release schedule of the live coding? I'm going to upload today in the state it is. Like awesome. I'm, I'm going to upload after the talks now. Okay. Great. Woo, thank you. <laughs> and, yeah, just quick follow-up question. What's sort of the roadmap of things that you're wanting to, to use a question to maybe let you tell us where else you're wanting to, to take also Studio or, or where could it, should it go? I mean, it's always been uh, quite, quite practical, the application. It's always been meant to solve problems that were unsolvable before. And I think there's like 500 different ideas. And uh, one of them that's the most driving factor is to maybe put bigger parts of the life set into Osti Studio, which is going to push it a lot. So it's not, I mean, that's a very vague answer. Of course, the timelines are horrible, I think. And the queues are not good. And uh, there's, uh, you can't really append files. You can't combine files. So it's full of problems. I see problems everywhere. But I think to focus on, on an actual problem. 
uh, helps get it somewhere. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I sat down here already before you started with two uh, uber nerdy questions. And one of them has been answered a little bit, I think. Um, we've talked a lot about this uh, brightness modulation because I've always been asking you for the oscilloscope application, please put a Z channel in there so that we can modulate the brightness with a, a third signal. And you've always been telling me, yes, but that's not how we do it. In uh, OSCE yeah. Studio Land, we do it another way. Um, and uh, am I correct now that you would use this weighting uh, tree thing that you just showed us to, to uh, uh, dip, like chop out parts of things or dim things? Is, exactly. is that how you solve this brightness problem, by yeah. only using you, two signals? You jump over certain parts of the face, or often also you, you increase the frequency of the face by quite a big factor, like three, four, five, and then you do different things in this time. So we, we don't really multiplex ever. Like we don't switch at a fixed frequency. We we mush it up. We we like we, we do this sort of multiplexing thing but in within one phase. And that's how everything stays uh on the same base frequency. Um, that, that's that's really quite fascinating actually to think that it, I, it's something it's you just, can it's only simply do zipping digital. past certain parts of the shape and making them dimmer or or making them not seen then, right? We also we use, uh, I'm gonna go back to the camera a second, or uh, am I taking from your talk if I show this? Like, so we don't really, where did I put my pen? Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, so we, so we don't really multiplex, like multiplexing would be you have like, you have two signals somehow and then you switch sometimes like at a fixed frequency what we do is we we sort of do this we we double it which in digital land you can do easily in analog land this is a pain um, and then here we show shape zero and here we show sh shape one and and this I think is one of the synthesis techniques that's not used so much but it produces incredible acoustic effects is by moving this point around. Wh where do you do this? Like, do you do this and this? Or do you do the other way around, this and this, to show shape zero and one? And this is also what's at the very top of OSCE Studio, actually. Like, how do you set the brightness? This, this is how you do it. And if so if you wanted more shapes in, a, in, a, in one phaser cycle, you would simply divide it by, th you would uh, three, four, by five. Three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. And then often bind this, like uh, the the running index, like so. Say you divide this in like five pieces. So you, this is also often interesting to put the same shape, but at different sizes. So you you can have uh, nestings and stuff like this. Nice, nice. Okay, are we ready for my second nerdy question? I feel like my first nerdy question has been answered. Um, the second one is the part that I found really fascinating about the ability to import these um, 3D objects in and uh, the work that it takes to render a 3D object into a single path through space in three axes. Can you please tell us a little bit more about that? About the algorithm yes, behind please. it? I, I can try to explain um, as much as I remember, at least. So the, the, the it's a graph theory problem, and I think it was solved roughly in the 50s or 60s, and it's called uh, either the Chinese postman problem, and then for people who think it's racist, which is maybe true, I don't know, but they call it the, the routing problem. Uh, and the, the question is, like, say you have, and it has nothing to do with dimensionality. Like, it it's doesn't matter if it's in 2D or 3D or 1D or 5D. It's, so it's all about nodes, and they're just numbered or something, and they're connected. And now the question is, if you have this, how do you find a pass? What's the first thing that it requires some thinking, but what, what Euler found out is, if you have an odd number of nodes here, you have a problem. And it's also kind of obvious, uh, because if you go in, you must go out. So you go in here and you go out, but like forget about the rest of the network, now you've done this and this, you still have one left to go and you need to go in, where do you go now? You have a problem. So the way the algorithm works, roughly, is you, um, you have some network, 
with some even and some odd. Uh, let's see what I made. One, two, three, four. So that's fine. That's I, I just write down the number of connections. Two is fine. One, two, three, problem. One, two, three, problem. Two, fine. Um, so the first stage of the algorithm is to identify all the odd nodes. And, and you circle them. And then you create what's called the complete graph. So you, uh, the complete graph of all the odd nodes. So you make a new network, um, which is just the odd nodes. In my case, the complete network is easy. It's just the connection between these two. If you have four nodes, it's every node connected to every other node. And so it's computationally, it's quite intense. Uh, and that's why I do it in a pre-processing stage and not in real time. And then once you have this, you, the weights of the edges, like the cost you assign to them, is um, is sort of the shortest pass. So, you, so for every combination of points, you solve the shortest pass problem in the network. And you, you put them here. I don't know. I just put random numbers because I have no idea what we're doing. Um, and then you, oh, I forgot. I'm not sure exactly. Wait, what do we do next? So we have this. And then. We need to pair them up, so we need a matching algorithm. So use a matching algorithm to find, to to always find pairs and make the cost minimal. And once you have this, you double the edges. In this case, that's just one edge. And now you have a network where every node has two edges. And once you have this, you can use Flurry's algorithm, which is also way old, and then that solves this problem. So it's a, it's a series of and that's also how, if, if you look it up in papers, that's precisely how they describe it. Um, for me, I didn't know enough graph theory, so the actual history of this algorithm in OSC Studio was find, find an implementation with a permissive license. I ported it to C++ and used it, and then over time just read up on all the graph theory, and like some point early last year, I switched it out for my own version, uh, which I don't know, it made me feel better to really understand deep down, like not just from an abstract, abstract level, but like actually code it myself. Fantastic, thank you so much. All right.